Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Star Trek Discovery Season 2, Episodes 3 and 4. Uh, so last week I was covering Vikings, I didn't cover Episode 3 of Discovery, so I'm going to do go ahead and do that now. As well as, dis as cover this week's episode uh, of Discovery. So last week's episode, of course, Episode 3, Point of Light. And I'll also cover uh, this week's episode, Episode 4, A Ogle for Charon. Cool, so let's go ahead and start with episode 3, Point of Light. So, I'll ha I agree with the masses here because the majority of people uh, uh, talk about this episode think that this is the weak point of the season and that this feels more like a season 1 Discovery episode than it does season 2. And it's definitely a step down from the first two episodes and I totally agree with that. However, I'm not on board with all the hyperbole about this being like the worst Star Trek episode ever. I mean, come on. <laughs> There's plenty, 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 plenty worse than this episode. Uh, I think it's a bit going overboard to say this is it was a giant piece of garbage and the worst Star Trek has ever been or whatever. But that being said, it is a step down from the excellent first two episodes. And it does feel a lot more like a season one episode of Discovery. And a lot of people will say, well, they're bringing the Klingons back, so obviously it's going to feel more like season one. I don't necessarily think that's true. I I don't think it's a default that automatically you bring the Klingons, and that's why it feels like season one. And I don't think like the Klingons were the only reason uh, this felt like a season one episode. I think the main reason why this felt like a season one episode is because it was too rushed and it felt the pacing was off. And that was my main issue with season one. And a lot of the episodes in season one, they try to cram too much uh, plot, too much story into one episode. And that's exactly what I think this episode did. You had the Klingon storyline about the new Empress uh, and her, you know, uh, Ash Tyler's or side man or whatever invoke, and people are like, oh, he's a human. And so there's this other Klingon of House Core. Why is Core the assholes? Uh, House Core is always the assholes in this in Discovery. But anyway, the asshole guy is like challenging her. And honestly, like, this is a storyline, and I saw they showed bits of it, like they showed that asshole Klingon dude in the trailer. And this is a storyline I was expecting to go all season, or at least span several episodes. And they just did it all in one episode, uh, which I think it was a huge disservice. I think it really didn't work. We had no time to get attached to any of the characters or any of the situations. Just boom, 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 boom. Not only did they do it all in one episode, but they did it in the episode with two other storylines going at the same time, which also progressed a lot. Although, like, the burn, burning and looking for Spock one didn't really progress that much. She had a few character uh, scenes with her and Amanda. But the other one with Tilly, you find out the, you know, the little creature she's talking to, like, that progressed a lot. Like, they found out that it was actually, you know... You know, other people find out it was actually like the spore thingy, which I think most people figure that out already. And most of the viewers, anyway. So it's kind of frustrating when the characters take a lot longer to figure out something than we, the audience, already know. So they did, they just did too much in this episode. Now, the Klingon, let me talk about the Klingon story in particular, because I think this is an interesting idea, an interesting story, and I don't automatically hate the Klingons as uh, a lot of people do. Like, I didn't mind them as much in Season 1, but um, as much as most people did. But <laughs> I don't think they ultimately worked that well. Uh, and I think this is an interesting storyline, but they didn't do it right. They didn't execute it very well. As I said, they were just boom, 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 boom. This is all of a sudden, uh, Ash Tyler finds out he has a baby, and all of a sudden the baby gets captured, and all of a sudden they rescue the baby, and all of a sudden they, they <laughs> you know, he, he threatens to kill the baby, and all of a sudden they kill the guy, and all of a sudden she announces to the world she has a head of Ash Tyler and the baby. I mean, really, I think they, they would have done this story at a lot more service if they stretched that over several episodes. And you, some people might go, Ugh! Do we re Mark, you really want them to have more Klingon in the, in the episodes? But hear me out. Not have it be a main storyline. 
in every episode, but have like touch on it again. And so give us time to sit with these revelations. Give us time to sit and and flesh out this villain, the asshole villain guy who whose makeup I love, by the way. But I'll touch more on the makeup shortly. <laughs> flesh him out more. Make him more of a threat rather than someone who's just oh i'm an asshole and now i'm dead like he didn't it wasn't a real threat i never got invested in this story uh even like again even if this was just a side like storyline that only took up like 10 minutes of each episode and you focus more on the red angel burnham stuff and just flash to this occasionally i think that would have that that's more of a game of thrones approach and I think how, because they go through the, the, the different storylines, and I think that approach would have worked more because it would have given the time, the audience more time to uh, think and reflect on these characters and get to know them. And they could also explore the characters more, explore how this affects Ash Tyler, uh, explore how the Section 31, and I'll get to them shortly too, how they held their role. But as is, cramming it all in the episode, into one episode, it was like boom, 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 boom. So I don't, it's very bad. I was very disconnected from it. Uh, I think, as I said, the story idea is a good concept, but the execution was horrible. Now, <laughs> speaking of the Klingons, I have to touch on, I mentioned the makeup. I have to touch on this thing with the makeup, because when the trailer... I talked about how, oh, they have hair. Thank God they have hair. And that, as I said, that one enemy Klingon dude, the one who has, like, long hair and a beard, like, I love his look. His look is awesome. He looks more like the traditional Klingons. But you get some other Klingons standing there, and they have, like, really big-ass fucking insect-like bulbous heads. And that still pisses me off. I just think they still, just get, stop that. Just get, fix the look. Just go back to something that's more like like that one dude. As I said, he looks more like a, a TNG DS9 era clan. Like his makeup is fine, but all these other ones have like little mustaches. But then, so then we get this line <laughs> in the episode where it's like, oh, well, the war is over now, so that's why they're growing our hair back. And this is something like someone tried to argue with me in the comments about this as well, Mark. Uh, the producers in the conventions or interviews or whatever said that the reason why the Klingons were bald was because uh, the, it's you know part of the culture when they go to war they shave their heads and don't, don't you see that and it's like why what do you have against bald Klingons freaking General Chain from Star Trek VI was bald <sighs> okay so that 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 comment just misses the point like spectacularly misses the point first of all. The whole thing about Klingons shaving their head when they go to war, bullshit, 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 bullshit. First of all, it's never been established that they shave their head when they go to war. Secondly, at the start of uh, the pilot episode, they weren't at war and they, none of them had hair. It is such retcon bullshit. It insults my intelligence that the producers even tried to, to say this and insults it even more that they had the audacity to put a line in the episode about that. Um, it's very obvious from the premiere episode and from the, all season one as a whole that these, what they were presenting as Klingons in season one, were incapable of growing hair. It was, they were, it's not that, oh, we chose to shave our head. BULLSHIT! <laughs> there were tons of clans before the war took place. You see other clans in different factions. They all just happened to be bald even before any war broke out or anything. Uh, it, it angers me. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's stupid. And the fact that they, they put this line to be like, well, see, that's why they had to make up change because they shaved it. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. I really wish, and I said this before, I really wish that they had just... Per not acknowledge this at all. Just pretend, just pretend it like it never happened. Just pretend it like they had hair the whole time. I really wish they would have done it. Also, I think they do need to correct the bulbous head, the giant insect heads, fix the makeup, and don't fucking acknowledge it. Don't be like, oh, thank God we have this plastic surgery to fix our shape of our head. No! Change the makeup and just 
just pass it off. It actually pissed me off when Star Trek Enterprise tried to, you know, give an explanation as to why there was a makeup change between the original series Klingons and Next Generation Klingons. And now it's part of canon, so a lot of Star Trek nerds bring that up all the time. Which I think is a lame explanation that doesn't really fit, first of all. Secondly, just don't explain it. Do not, just don't touch on it. Just, this, as an audience member, you know there's a, you know, a natural makeup change as technology progresses. And that's actually my issue with uh, Star Trek uh, technology and how this uh, technology is a lot more advanced in Discovery because it's filmed in 2018 and not in 1966. Um, but I'll touch more on that in the next episode. That's another thing I wish they would just not acknowledge because I just don't, I don't have an issue with that. It's just I, as an audience member, I'm aware of the fact that it's being filmed in 2019 not in 1966. But anyway, <laughs> let me move on <laughs> to section 31. This is silly. I think the way um, Giorgio, like, you kind of give it away from some of the promotional material because it is, and they're all talking about doing a spinoff show. And with that in mind, the scenes with her, especially towards the end when they were on that Section 31 ship and had all those dynamic shots and they're all looking, oh, do you think we can recruit him? <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that came off as a, a proto-pilot. As, oh, look! Look, look at how cool these guys are. We're going to give them their own show so you can watch it. Ha, 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 I mean, that, that's what it came off to me as. And, and again, part of the reason why I think Giorgio in particular, when she had that weird, like, Aquaman, it like, looked like the villain from Aquaman. <laughs> that outfit where she'd come in to start shooting, and it's like, of course it's Giorgio. What a shock. And, um... Like, again, the issue is that they, they went too fast with that storyline. They didn't give us time to to, uh, to uh, invest in the storyline, to invest in the characters in the situation. And it just felt like a Deus Ex Machina. It felt like a very cheap, ooh, let's throw in Giorgio, let's throw in Section 31 because they're cool, and look at the cool ship and it's all. And that's, <laughs> that's what it felt like. It felt forced, it felt fake. Felt contrived. I didn't. I. I'm not <laughs> looking forward. They, they're not impressing me so far. I'm not looking forward to a Section 31 spinoff. If it's gonna, if it's gonna be like this, uh, because that was bullshit. Uh, yeah, and the whole thing like when what's her face revealed that the heads of you know Tyler and the baby. I, come on, was there a single solitary person watching it who actually thought? that those were the actual heads of the babies and that they were dead and wasn't just a Section 31 trick. If you are, I have a bridge. <laughs> I have waterfront property in Arizona to sell you if, that, if, if you were convinced by that. Anyway, <sighs> let's, let's move on to Burnham, Amanda, and Spock. He's gone insane. Like, these scenes were okay. Uh, I don't think they were that. I mean, I I kind of prefer the the Pike stuff. Anything with Pike in it is probably. Uh, I'm starting to really love Pike. I'm sorry. At first, I was kind of iffy on that because his character doesn't at all match uh, the original series. But I think with season two of Discovery, I'm learning that you just have to like take stuff like that with a grain of salt and just move beyond it and enjoy the storyline for what it is. And I I'm really enjoying the stuff they do with Pike. So I really enjoyed the scenes with uh, him and Burnham and how he was, you know, she talked him into contacting the mental hospital and he got the information about how Spock was accused of murder, which, you know, I don't know, I'm not up in arms about that because, like, some people, oh, that's filing canon because Spock never murdered him. But here's the thing. Star Trek has done these falsely accused of murder storylines like billions of times. So this is just par for the course. This is this is the show being like Star Trek basically here. Where here's another falsely accused uh, story, falsely accused of murder, murder storyline. It's obvious Spock didn't do it, or there's a greater explanation as to why. And um, and again, some people are kind of frustrated with how they're dragging the storyline out, but I'm not. I'm actually really enjoying this this method of storytelling, and I think it's interesting how we go from adventure to adventure uh, and then kind of touch on this. And the whole thing with Amanda and Burnham, like, yeah, they're, what they're talking about in the bracelet ship with Spock really felt like 
retconning and <laughs> doesn't really fit into the original series. But as I said, I'm going to move past that. Anyway, um, let's talk about Tilly and how you know she makes a fool of herself and insults Pike, which I actually thought that was a cool little scene. I didn't have an issue with that. And I actually really like, I, I've heard other people complain about this, but I love the fact that they just went out, she just, that they found out that uh, the person, the imaginary friend she was talking to, May, is actually like a spore alien and that the spore thing has to set everyone to figure that one out. Like, I figured that out. I thought that was pretty obvious. <laughs> um, uh, well, that's because, like, the viewers, they made a point of showing that one of the other characters. So I'm not blaming the other characters for not knowing this, but um, it wasn't shocking, a shocking reveal or anything. But I like the fact that they figured this out in this episode. I heard other people complain, oh, they should have, you know, dragged this out longer. Actually, I disagree. I'm glad they just got right to that, especially because that May person was very annoying. <laughs> it was kind of funny how she's like, that's not the captain! When it was Pike, and then when she sees Stamus, she's like, oh, that's the captain. And you get, and that's when you're getting the, you know, because she's like talking about the spore drive, and that's where he goes and drives a ship. So that, it's very interesting, actually. I did really like that, and I, I, I found this storyline was probably the strongest of the episode. Uh, I personally thought it was interesting. I lo as again, I love that it didn't dwell on the fact that, oh, she's crazy, I'm not crazy, I'm blah, 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 blah. You get right to the point. Yeah, we scanned you, and as an alien. Boom, I love that. Get right to the point. <laughs> anyway, and then they got the alien out of her. So that was great. So anyway, my rating for Point of Light out of 10 is a 5 average. Um... Yeah, I think I'll give this a five. Um, because it was the Klingon storyline was a mess. It was too rushed. The Section Thirty One introduction was sloppy as all hell. And, and don't give me bullshit excuses as to why you did the makeup change. Just do the makeup change. And uh, and the Burnham Pike stuff and Spock and Amanda stuff that was okay. That that was passable. And I really liked the Tilly stuff. Uh, so. And that's why I'm saying this is not an altogether horrible episode, but it's not really that you know, good episode either. So I'll give it a 5 out of 10. Anyway, <laughs> let me move on to uh, episode 4, an obol for Charan, uh, which I've watched tons of videos that explain what this means. It has to do with the legend you pay the you know, keeper or whatever. I don't know, but you, you can look it up. But I was saying that is how Discovery titles are very pretentious. Like, someone pointed this out. And I think it's Star Trek Discovery and Orphan Black are, like, in the competition who has the most pretentious episode titles. Like, season one, like, you know, Point of Light, that's not pretentious. But season one had a lot of pretentious. Uh, the Butcher's Nice, Cares Not, Cries Not, or whatever the fuck that was called. Uh, they had the most pretentious titles. But have you ever seen Orphan Black? Uh, I used to do reviews for that, and I... I used to read out the titles. I'm like, my God, these titles are so pretentious. I actually think Orphan Black's titles were more pretentious, but Star Trek Discovery is giving it a run for its money. Anyway, getting beyond the title, I think this is the best episode of Discovery yet. I think it's definitely the best episode of Season 2 uh, out of the four that is aired. Like, I really, really like this episode. I really enjoyed it. Not only did this episode feel like Star Trek, this episode is fucking Star Trek. And I've always said this for a long time, that Discovery is Star Trek. But this, this, this is like quintessential Star Trek. This, uh, <laughs> this episode is like amazing character story having to do with this weird sci-fi phenomenon that ties in to the, uh, you know, inter character interactions. You get the character uh, journeys and how uh, you get a, you got a lot of development with Sauber. You got a lot of development with Burnham. A development, which by the way I thought was really natural, really worked, and at the same time there was this interesting sci-fi plot to it that tied it all together, um, and I loved it. I think it really worked. Um, now, I think this this episode does is actually in fact better than a lot of Next Generation and Voyager episodes because with Next Generation and then Voyager killed this cliche, but in particular. But Next Generation and Voyager had this running cliche, and I talked about this in the Orville review because the Orville did the same cliche too, and I bashed it for that. Is where they have like an A plot and the B plot, and the A plot is um, 
like a character, a boring character story, typically, that's not done really well. And the B-plot is uh, some weird sci-fi shit that puts the anomaly or other bullshit, uh, dark, you know, dark matter aliens or freaking eddy space eddies or, you know, interphasic space where people just, you know, just bullshit that nobody cares about. It's just there to give the threat of the week while they focus on a boring character story. And Next Generation has done this uh, a lot and Voyager killed this cliche uh, and you know, I blame Brennan Braga because he, he also involved in Orville which is probably why they did it. Anyway, it's a cliche that I hate and this episode subverts that. It, it does what all those Voyager and Next Generation episodes couldn't do. Instead of having oh, here's a boring character story going at the same time with a threat of the week it takes a threat of the week uh, a strange spatial anomaly and the character story, but it fits them together. They don't feel like, oh, here's, let's just have this interphasic space thingy just to keep you interesting, just to keep the threat going. No, it ties it ties directly into uh, the sorrow thing. In fact, these you can't. I wouldn't even call this an A in the B plot because they bleed together so much and so often. I I wouldn't even say that. So bravo, I was very impressed with this episode, first of all, for doing that. Now, let me touch on Saru, because this episode builds off of the canon established in the short treks, which I have recently watched, by the way. I still haven't watched the one with Harry Mudd, but I've seen all the other ones. And uh, I've recently watched the one with Saru, where they give this backstory, and this uh, episode heavily builds off of that. Um, which is, t has, and I totally agree with my brother who said this in his re review of that short track, is totally and utterly and completely inconsistent with uh, everything established about Saru in Season 1. <laughs> and again, this is another thing I have to take with a grain of salt. And I'm not, I don't think I'm as upset over that short track as uh, my brother was. Uh, but I totally agree that it's completely inconsistent with everything they established of Saru. But I just have to accept now that this is the new canon and move on with my life. That, okay, and if I, and again, if I <laughs> accept it, that this is where they're going with Saru, to just pretend that stuff in season one didn't really happen, that it establishes species as being something different, okay. This is actually good. If I just want my mind wipe season one and be like, this is the new canon with Saru. The starts of the short track and then furthers up in here and this is what the Kelpians are like. It's actually really fascinating. It is a really good uh, way to take this new alien species that hasn't been established in track and do something. It's a really interesting concept, first of all, to have an alien who's like primitive or like pre-warp uh, that uh, still is under, you know, the prime directive that they can't uh, interfere with or, or talk to because of that and have a member of that species be a one of the main characters who's in Starfleet. That's, that's a really interesting concept. And I love the personal conflicts you get with Saru because he knows his, his conflict between wanting to help his people and not wanting to violate his, his oath as a Starfleet officer. And you, it does explore Saru a lot in this episode about how he knows all the languages and uh, just the type of person he was and the effort that he made. And also, I gotta say, like, the scenes between Saru and Burnham in this episode were amazing. This is why I love the episode. In fact, like, I talk about season one negatively a lot, but I didn't altogether hate season one, if you know my opinion. There were, there were things about season one that I really liked. What And the scenes of the season one that I liked the most were the character-based scenes, the character interactions, particularly with Ash Tyler and Burnham, but then there's other character interactions where you really get, like, the emotional character stories, because I think that's, that's what Discovery does best. Like, some of the plot-driven stuff, particularly in season one, they didn't do well so much, but when it gets down to the bare bone character interactions, I think that's something that they they do right, and you get a prime prime example, probably the best example I might I might even say, of that in this episode uh, with Burnham and Saru. Like I was almost in tears uh, in their moments, like when he was begging her 
kill it. And, like, someone compared this to, like, the Next Generation episode, Ethics, where Worf is like, oh, I kill me because I'm injured in my back or he's paralyzed or whatever. And I, I thought that episode was boring. <laughs> I wasn't really emotionally invested in it. Um, they didn't sell me as well as the, they sold me. Like, in this episode, just the way that Burnham and, and so we're talking about how their family, like, and I've heard other opinions, people think, oh, they don't buy that as inconsistent because they were, you know, snipping at each other in season one, but I totally bought it because I think they earned that through, I mean, yes, they hated each other at, at the start of season one after what Burnham did to Giorgio, but you start to gradually get them coming back together throughout season one, uh, and by the end of season one, they're like, you totally get that they they connected in this journey that they had to go through through the Mary universe and through winning the Klingon War, uh, that they had really connected. So, and that 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 bond had grown even stronger in season two until you get to this point where I complete. And in fact, I not only will I say I bought it, I would, I think this is one of the best like character like relationship developments uh, in all of Trek. Uh, personally, I, the gradual way they built up to this, I thought was brilliant. Um, <laughs> I absolutely uh, loved it. And this, as I said, the scenes between them were like so well acted and so touching. Like, yes, th th it was absolutely uh, done so well. Now, <laughs> the thing with Saru almost dying, and this is another reason I'll get back to my comparison to the Next Generation episode Ethics, where the dwarf, you know, wanting to kill himself, is that. Part of the reason why I wasn't invested in that episode is because I knew Wolf wasn't going to die. It's quite simple. Like, you're not going to kill off a main character that's just an episode like that. But with Discovery, just by its nature and a more modern way of television, I actually believed that they would kill off Saru. I was totally convinced that they would kill off Saru. And because they earned that, because they have killed off characters, uh, Jojo, uh, Lorca, they have killed off characters right enough before, and so they made it clear, and that is the more modern mindset of uh, that no one is, um, no one is, uh, everyone's expendable, no one is, uh, uh, you know, immune, except for maybe Michael Byrne. But, um, and I was, yeah, so, and that's part of the reason why I was a hell of a lot more invested, because I thought, like everyone else, that he was going to die, and I didn't feel cheated, like, I feel, and I can understand some people who said they felt cheated by the fact that, oh, it's a fake out, he's, they say he's going to die, but because he, he doesn't really die, but, and that's another Trek cliche, but I don't feel as cheated by this one as I did the previous Trek cliche, because of the because it was a real possibility that he might die uh and the, also the way that they played it it really sold it to me that his life was actually in peril it wasn't like oh who cares i know they're going to be alive next week let's just go down with it i didn't have that feeling here and i think that really goes a long way to to selling this and um I, I will say that I am very happy that they didn't kill him off. That if they had killed him off, I would have been really pissed off. Because Saru, especially this episode, goes leaps and bounds to develop Saru. If you see my season one reviews, you know I hated Saru. He was my least favorite character because he freaking tortured a sentient being and got off scot-free and no one even called him on it. It pissed me off. But that's season one writing for you. <laughs> and so for a while I hated him because of that and I thought everything he did to help people was just hypocritical after that. But that's another thing I had to wipe from my mind because I was that episode was just bad writing and I had to focus more on what the good writers are doing with Saru now. As, and so they, I, it's actually, it was a journey for them, for me, for them to get me to like this character I didn't like before. And this episode in particular gives leaps and bounds to develop him, to make him interesting, to flesh him out, to make you really sympathetic with the situation. So if they just kill him off, that, that would suck. <laughs> quite frankly and plus he had, had this really good character now and for them to just get rid of them yeah and some people thought it would have been a bold move I thought it would have been a bad move so I'm actually glad that they kept him alive and I don't feel cheated or slighted uh, that they did keep him alive that they made you think that they were going to kill him I actually thought that was done really well um so let's talk about uh, apparently his name is Linus um, I'm watching Lost right now, so it makes me think of Benjamin Linus. But anyway, uh, 
it's this alien, the alien dude that does the clicks and things. Like, it, it, he, they had the gag with him in the elevator. I honestly thought that was a one-off, and that was the only time we see him. But now we see him again, and I like that. I like, and they're starting to show the supporting character again. This is throughout all season two. They're showing the bridge supporting characters a lot more, which I'm really looking forward to getting to know them more. I'm pretty sure we're getting more uh, information on them coming. Uh, but, and I love uh, the fact that um, they had this, you know, that weird alien. And it shows a lot of different aliens. This is something Star Trek couldn't do in the past for budgetary reasons. And I love that Discovery is taking advantage of the fact they have a bit bigger budget. And, and, you know, modern technology is advanced to make it a bit cheaper or easier to do all these different aliens that they're showing. Because that never really jived, particularly Next Generation, when they said there was tons of different aliens in the Federation, yet you only see humans and the token alien characters. Like, you rarely saw... I think New Space Nine was a bit better at this, because it was, supposed to, it was an alien port, so they went out of their way to have more alien background characters, even if they were in Starfleet. But I, I think Discovery is definitely taking this to a new level, and really portraying a Federation, a United Federation of planets, of lots of different uh, aliens. So I love to have this one alien who communicates between Click and Click. He's really, really alien from most other humanoids, yet he's still a member of Starfleet. And then you got, uh, you know, Saru, of course, is uh, from a pre warp civilization, so that adds to it. And then you got the uh, other, uh, what's her face, from the Enterprise who joined Pike. I, someone pointed out to me recently, and I didn't realize this before, that she's actually a Barzon who appeared in the Next Generation uh, episode, The Price, if you recall the Barzon wormhole. Uh, uh, so, and I, once I noticed, I was like, hey, oh, hey, yeah, <laughs> that's right, it's a Barzon. And I love that. I love how they took an alien who appeared in one episode of Next Generation and just casually made it here without making a big deal out of it. I... I'm loving that, and I love the fact that they took the Linus, the fact that he um, he said something that they couldn't understand. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, the Universal Translator sometimes doesn't translate me correctly. So it's, it foreshadows the Universal Translator, and then it gets into the main plot where the Universal Translator malfunctions. Now, I think I've heard a misunderstanding, or at least a different interpretation of this scene than what I had, because a lot of people were assuming that when the Universal Translator malfunctioned, everyone resorted to their native language, and so no one really spoke English, and that's why they couldn't communicate with each other. But that's, no, that's what, not what I got. I got that the Universal Translator was translating their languages into weird random languages that they didn't necessarily know how to speak. I think that was made clear when uh, Burnham was speaking Klingon. She's like, why am I speaking Klingon? And then, uh, you know, Pike was speaking whatever he was speaking. And so I think that, so I don't think they were all speaking their native language. I think they were just speaking random languages because of the universe. And uh, what's your Detmer was like, I can't read the readout because they were just putting it in a language that she didn't, some random language. It was like totally scrambling all the languages. That's what I got out of it anyway. And so it wasn't necessarily the case that none of them, they all needed the universal translator in order to, to communicate with each other is that the Universal Translator was scrambling their languages and making them, even if they did speak the same language, it was making it impossible for them to communicate uh, with each other, is what I got out of it. Anyway, <laughs> um, I thought that was interesting too. I thought it was a cool use of the Universal Translator because in the original series, Next Generation, it was just a device, especially the original series, it was just an excuse to have, you know, space aliens that just meet for the first time speak English. Uh, it, was made, it was an excuse made in retrospect. Now, I think Enterprise started to play off of this a bit more and actually treat it as a real thing because it was in its infancy, so they were actually having to translate. But I love, I love seeing them take the Universal Translator more seriously in a more modern uh, setting, even, in, you know, original series setting uh, still is more modern than Enterprise. Uh, and um, and the more you know, futuristic setting, I should say. But where the Universal Translator is like a given, and people usually don't notice, but they actually they make you notice it. They make you realize that it's actually an important part of the Federation and Starfleet. And if it malfunctions, then it could cause complete chaos, and people are not interest, uh, able to communicate. And I love the reveal that it was the, the Red Dwarf was dying. 
or not red dwarf, whatever the weird orb thingy, whatever it was, <laughs> that it was trying to communicate with them, and that's why it was fucked up the universe translated because it was trying to communicate it. I thought that was awesome. And I like I like the main storyline through storyline about the, you know, space thingy uh, trying to communicate its knowledge before it died and trying to leave a legacy. It reminded me a lot of the inner light. Uh, the next generation episode where, you know, Picard has that proby thing <laughs> attached to him and he lives his whole life, but his alien species is wiped out because they wanted to leave a legacy behind. And I like that. I thought it, it had a real, uh, that Star Trek feeling to it. And I like, I love how Pike was uh, willing to put the ship in danger to to uh, save uh, this information, uh, to protect this information. By doing so, the thing itself protected the Enterprise. Uh, I thought that was really touching. I thought it was a great uh, story. I really liked that. Now, let me talk about number one. Number one! <laughs> I'm really glad we saw number one. I've been dying to see number one, even before they announced that she was going to be in the show. Um, and because there's a, we only saw that one episode, The Cage. That's all we saw her from. But she was an important part of the Enterprise crew. And they kind of, to be honest, they kind of mar marginalized her in that episode because it was the 60s. And part of the reason why the pilot didn't get picked up is because, oh, a female first officer, no one's going to buy that. So I love seeing, in retrospect, them flesh out her character a bit more. Even if she didn't appear that much, you still, through her interactions with Pike and seeing the type of relationship they had and seeing how, you know, she was a great first officer and how she was taking charge and she was able to find things that most people couldn't find. I really enjoyed that. Now, some people are saying uh, it's bullshit that we hardly saw any of her and that she needed to be in the episode more and the, and she better appear more in later episodes otherwise it's bullshit. I disagree. If this is all we got to get of her, I'm perfectly fine with it. It won't bother me. I would prefer to see more of her, sure. But <laughs> I'm not going to pitch a fit and whatever if we don't. If we don't, that's fine. I mean, because she's not, she was never an important focus of even, you know, in, of the original series, so uh, I don't think she needs to be a focus of, uh, of season two of Discovery either. It'd be cool to see more of her, though. Uh, all right, so I, so let's talk about uh, Stamets and Reno uh, and the, the interactions they had. It was cool seeing Reno again. Uh, she's a cool, quirky character and is interesting. She brings a cool dynamic to Discovery. And it's interesting seeing her, because her and Stamets are both big personality people. So it's interesting seeing these big personalities clash and go against each other and how they're just talking circles around each other. And Reno usually gets the better of Stamets, which is he's not used to. And I love that. I thought it was a really cool dynamic. And I like how it was interplayed between the storyline of, uh, you know, Tilly, the spore thing, he's trying to reconnect to Tilly and take her over, uh, which I thought was a very uh, intense storyline as well. I think it complemented the, the main storyline nicely, and uh, it was interesting. We, I was not too surprised that we learned that the, you know, these are spore aliens who are kind of pissed off at Stamets for, for <laughs> apparently every time they use the spore drive, it kind of fucked up with their environment, so they, uh, he sees him as an invader. I like how when you know she mentioned oh invaders, and and Stamets is like oblivious to the fact that he was the invader. It's like no, you're the invader I'm talking about, <laughs> which is it was just cool because it's not what he intended. Now, as surmised, a lot of people are guessing that this is how they explain that the spore drive uh, wasn't in the original series, Next Generation, or any future Star Trek show, and I think. And I can, a lot of, some people saw this coming. I think a lot of people saw this coming from last week in particular. But I think it's a perfectly good explanation. I am very satisfied with this explanation. It makes perfect sense for me why uh, they wouldn't use a spore drive if, by using it, they uh, kill, like, fuck up with these other aliens. Now, I've heard other people complain, like, and particularly in season one of Discovery, people were complaining, like, well, there's this magical spore drive, how come Voyager never used it? Because it would have came in handy for them, because they were all the way in the other side of the galaxy and had the spore drive, they could have got home. So the spore drive violates canon, because why didn't Voyager use the spore drive? But Voyager encountered the Equinox, who were, you know, trying to get home at another alien's expense. 
and Voyager and Janeway in particular made it crystal clear they were not okay with harming other aliens or killing other aliens regardless of who they were in order for their own benefit to get home. So there you go. If it's established the spore drive harms these other aliens and kills these other aliens, of course Voyager's not going to do this. So case closed as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, I think it's a perfect good explanation unlike the stupid Klingon thing. But, and another explanation, let me get, which I also think is stupid, <laughs> is the um, Pike's throwaway comment. It's like, oh, rip off the holly, hologram, and then there's, I'm sick of the holograms. They look like ghosts. Let's just do view screens. Don't have that line in there. And again, it's kind of like the Klingon thing. It's just you're insulting our intelligence. It's, oh, so how Enterprise takes up the holly. What about every other ship in Starfleet for the next 200 years or however many years it wasn't until like Deep Space Nine season 5 where they introduced it and it was like this is brand new technology it's not like this is technology we used to use a century ago but for some reason people thought it looked like ghosts and it's just like, don't have that line in there just give it a pass just say it's a technology change because the show is being created in 2019 not 1966 move on with your life anyway <laughs> My rating for an Obol for Tehran out of 10 is a 9 excellent. This is, I wouldn't quite say, that, I wouldn't give it a 10. I wouldn't say this is one of the best episodes ever, but was really impressed with this episode. I really enjoy. I do think it is definitely, maybe if not the best episode of Discovery, then definitely one of the best episodes of Discovery so far. And it makes me look at uh, the potential of where the show is going to go. I feel very good about that. I feel very good that they are definitely turning this show around. And I actually think, like, season two still has some issues, like episode three <laughs> pointed out those issues. So I feel like Discovery is going to be like every other Star Trek show, minus Voyager, where the first two seasons were not so good, but they caught their footing and they got better in later seasons. So I can't, I think season three for Discovery is going to knock it out of the park. I'm, one can hope. I think I see the, this potential there, but I'm really enjoying season two. I can't wait to see the rest of it. Anyway, that is it for my review of Star Trek Discovery episodes three and four. I will be back next week for my review of episode five, so be sure to check it out. Also, check out my channel as I cover uh, many other Star Trek videos, and I cover other shows like Game of Thrones, uh, Lost, The Expanse, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.